Good morning, Michael. Good morning. How are you doing? Great. Good I'm delighted to finally get down here. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to my audience and tell us a little bit about GIY? Yeah, so my name is Michael Kelly, so I'm the founder of, of GIY. Um, I suppose we're, we're an organisation that, that tries to help people to make more sustainable food choices and grow some of their own food is the kind of key, key way that I think we help people do that. So we, we started in 2008 here in Waterford and um, started as a very small community uh, food growing group basically it was, it was I always kind of say it was like a kind of a self-help group for me basically because I, <laughs> I had started growing my own food and was really bad at it and um, wanted to, to learn more about it and, and connect with other food growers but there was kind of nothing nothing really out there to join it was all like um, I remember sitting in a, in a gardening club meeting somewhere in Waterford and thinking you know this is the more they the more they spoke about um, azaleas and, and hostas and stuff I thought this is not for me you know because I have no no interest in growing anything unless I can eat it at the end of the day. Um, so I started GIY from that and, and um, it was it was a really part-time voluntary thing at the start and, and I think we just immediately felt that we sort of um, we just touched touched a nerve and, and people just understood it and loved it from day one and it started to kind of spread around the southeast this idea of, of GI, a GIY group um, and within a year I sort of packed in my, my day job and started um, uh, we started to set GIY up as a, as a social enterprise to promote food growing at a, at a national and then international scale and um, it's been, been holding on for dear life ever since, you know. Fantastic. And so what is your career to date? So before 2008 when you started yeah. Grow It Yourself, what, what was your career? So, like? Yeah, so I, I was working in IT. Uh, when I left college I was, I was um, selling computer systems effectively. Um, not, not loving it, I think it's fair to say, just, you know, you kind of, you fall into these jobs um, and um, always kind of felt I wanted to do something else and I thought, I thought that thing was, um, was writing, actually I wanted to be a journalist and uh, when I gave up IT I was doing, I was writing kind of freelance for the Irish Times and the Independent and a few other papers for a couple of years. Um, but then life had other ideas for me. I guess once GIY started, um, you kind of you kind of think it's funny, you know, like all of the the kind of corporate experience I had of, of working in business and all of that. I kind of thought that was not something I wanted to do or, or was a waste of my time. But actually, kind of sets you up for for the next stage of your life ultimately. You know, so the, what I learned in that ten years working in business, I think, has stood stood to me really ultimately. Okay, and so there's GIY and this is Grow HQ. What's the difference? Yeah, so I, I suppose GIY, like our evolution as an organisation, I think we 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 started very much, you know, for the first couple of years, it was like there was there was say a hundred of these GIY groups dotted around Ireland originally, and that was fantastic. Um, and it was really people coming together in their own community to help each other to grow food, which was brilliant and, and still still a very important part of what we do. But I think we got kind of frustrated at the pace of change um, uh, because everything we were doing was rooted in the idea that if we could get people to, to grow some of their own food, it would have this huge knock-on effect of their, uh, on their, their health and how sustainably they lived. And so we always felt our job was to just get as many people as we possibly could to do it. And the GIY groups, while they were, they were fantastic, um, it just wasn't enough. Um, and so we started to run programs. In, in the first case, it was, it was in schools, um, because we felt it was very important to reach, reach kids with this, yeah. this message, as you know very well. Um, and so we started um, doing these big programs in schools to get to get kids growing and then we started running programs in communities and um, in, in companies and you know for chefs and everything else so I suppose we learned the programs on top of the community organizations or the community groups that we had and then you know we were all we worked out of, originally out of my, 
my kitchen at home, then, then an office in Waterford running these programs. Um, but we always felt we were missing a kind of a, a place that we could, that would be just a living example of yeah. everything we wanted to do. And so Grow HQ was, um, we opened in October 2016. Um, and the idea of it was just to create a place where we could show people our view of the world, a place where people could come and learn how to grow and cook food. Um, but really importantly, that they'd be able to come and eat homegrown food. So. We approached the, the city council here in Waterford, who had always been very, you know, very supportive of our work, um, and they gave us this site, which is uh, you wouldn't know it from sitting in here this morning, but it's um, it's a three-acre site. It's very urban, like the 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 hospital. That's the hospital. Yeah. That, yeah, the hospital is right across the road. And in some ways, like when I saw it first, we we came to visit this site when it was a field, you know, because it, it was this very odd little at the site at the side of the, the a really really busy road about 30,000 cars a day pass by our, our board there and the first day I saw it I was like this is terrible it's really ugly you know apartment buildings and all of that um, and the more I thought about it the more I thought this is exactly where we should do it because it's right in front of 100 people's noses and you know I think I think the risk is if we did it out in the countryside down a leafy lane somewhere people would be like oh well that's all, all very well for you guys but you know, 65% of Irish people live in urban in an urban setting, so yes. this is what makes it relevant to them. Um, so we opened in October 2016, um, and, and really the, the ethos of here is that everything we serve in the cafe, which is just across the hall there, is, um, is grown on site more or less, and, and then whatever we can grow ourselves or rare ourselves, we, we buy locally and seasonally, and, I see you put a poll out on Twitter the other day for some locally grown, what was it, veg was it? Yeah, well actually we, we've had um, a really bad year for salads um, okay. and particularly, normally you'd have salads right through the winter but because we had, we had a very cold October and mm -hmm. um, so the growth just stopped in its tracks uh, very suddenly and the, the late salads that we, we sold didn't come on quickly enough. Okay. Um, so yeah, we were, look, we're, we're actively looking for um, for salads, but in fact nobody has them. Um, sure. okay. Everybody's in the same boat right. sort of thing. So again, that's that's another you know conversation point with our customers to sort of say, well, actually we've taken our two salads off the menu for the winter because we just don't have them. You know, we're not going to decide well let's just import a lot of leaves or use some non-organic leaves or whatever. We don't do that. And that's a slight difference to our approach here. Brilliant. And so I've been meaning to come and visit Grow HQ for a good while, particularly with the kids. Um, but that just hasn't happened. So I had to come myself here just before Christmas to try and do this. But one of the stories I heard was about uh, ketchup. That once you run out of tomatoes, you've got to create another ketchup. Tell yeah. me a bit about that. Yeah, but I mean, the, the seasonality of food is the most important ethos point for us here. So, so like, we, we always try to serve food that's organic, um, either certified organic or organically grown, um, seasonal, local, nutritious, all of those things. And, and of all of those, I think um, seasonality is the most important point. And so, you know, ketchup traditionally, as, as a, just one example of that, was um, effectively was a way to preserve tomatoes. That's, you know, we forget, yeah. we think of it as a common, but in fact, it, it was always a preservation technique. And so that's how we use it. We use it to preserve our tomatoes. And when it runs out, you know, we're not going to replace it with like a, a, um, a shop bought ketchup. So we move on to other ketchups like beetroot and, and so on. So. It's a very interesting conversation at the table, as you can imagine. Like we do a lovely, um, we do lovely chips here. We really got just good organic Irish potatoes, uh, often our own. Um, and so people are like, "Can I have ketchup with my chips?" And we're like, "Well, I'm sorry, you know, we're we're out of tomato ketchup, but we've got beetroot. That's what's in season." And you know, most of our customers, I think, find that intriguing and interesting. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like. That's disgraceful. I just want some ketchup. Give me the ketchup. Uh, and we have, it has been um, one particular customer we saw taking a bottle of ketchup out of their inside pocket one time, you know. Uh, but, but he was a regular, so we, we couldn't get 
to look it's at. It's a great way of getting people to stop and think about it. I think it's, yeah. it's brilliant. So like, I mean, we're, we live in a society now where seasonal seasonality is is almost like a, a relic of a bygone age. You know, there's, there's a, a supermarket is a place where there are no seasons, really. You can get, you know, and that's the way we cook now. We take the cookbook and we're like, I'm going to have this, and we go off to the supermarket and buy the ingredients. Um, and you will get those ingredients any time of the year. And that's, that's only like a last 20 years yeah. trend before that. We, we went with the seasons, and I, I would always argue that seasonality, eating seasonally is your best, you know, your best guarantee of eating food that's at its most delicious and its, and its most nutritious. So it's not, you know, being able to buy a, 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 a tomato all year round is not necessarily a good thing, and, and particularly in terms of flavour and nutrition. Yeah, okay. Great, and you run some cookery courses here. Can you tell yeah. me, you've got a chef here, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so so we have um, a full programme of courses that run throughout the year. So mix of, of course, you know, we do courses around growing. So I, I deliver a course here once a month, a beginner's guide to growing and our own, our head grower here, Richard Lee, uh, runs a lot of courses as well. And then on the cookery side, our head chef is, uh, French guy lived in Ireland for years called JB Dubois, um, and he's an amazing, you know, leader I suppose in this business, but also does a lot of our courses here in cooking. We do everything from, um, you know, last night he had a course about getting ready for for kind of vegan eating in January, and um, which which I think is really interesting. But we're not anti meat at all here. We we serve meat in the cafe. He does courses around cooking with meat and everything in between, you know, we're, we're um, and also next year we have a lot of courses around sustainable living and, and you know, reducing your food waste, reducing your plastic consumption uh, and so on and so on, so it's, yeah, busy, busy spot. Right, and so I know, like my cookery demos that I do in the workplace, you also do a, a corporate uh, yeah. side to the business, what, what's that? Yeah, so, I mean, like I'm a, I'm a big believer in the idea that like there's some serious change coming down the tracks and, and needs to be. Um, and in some ways, I think government is lagging behind uh, on that. And I think business is such a powerful force in the world, you know, for good and bad, um, that it has a huge role to play in making the changes we need to make to make the, the planet uh, more sustainable. And um, so we, we've always felt Working with corporates is a hugely important part of, of what we do. So we have a program called Growth Circle, which is um, um, helping the companies to support their employees to make more sustainable food choices. So all of the things kind of we've already spoken about: growing more food, wasting less food, reducing your plastic consumption, following the seasons, um, and so it's it's a, it's a, it's basically an education program that we roll out to corporates. Um, and we've had a phenomenal response to that in the last three or four months in particular. I think corporates are really kind of waking up to it now and want to do something and want to be seen to be doing something, which is good. Um, so the likes of AIB and Guinness and Innocence have signed up to that program. We're hoping to have a lot more in the years ahead. So it's, it's, it's even as a way to reach a lot of people very quickly, it's a, it's a brilliant way to do that's what I find in my cookery demos, and you're reaching so many more people yeah. if I do a, a workplace demo. Yeah. And um, the schools, so um, if people want to get your program into their schools, how is that funded or how does someone go about doing that? Yeah, so we have a couple of different uh, school programs, like we're trying to kind of get, you know, across the different age groups. Um, so our main uh, primary school program is called Big Girls, so we work with um, with Innocent on that, and it's it's um, it's at a pretty huge scale. It's it's um, I think five thousand schools will take part next year across the UK and Ireland. So so we literally physically send out kits into the classrooms that, that the teachers can um, uh, and the resources that the, the teachers need to deliver an in classroom food growing program for the kids. Um, and we're we're really proud of it. I mean, it was I think. 300,000 people took part in it last year um, and a similar ambition for 2020 and beyond. Um, 
Then we have a, a secondary school program called Grow to CEO, uh, which I suppose starts with that basic food growing ex experience as well. Uh, but then we, we build a layer of food entrepreneurship on top of it. So they have to design a food brand and, and a marketing plan and all of that for their for their uh, for the product they create from what they've grown. And that uh, last year about half of secondary schools in Ireland took part in that, and that will be open for registrations in the new year as well. And then we have a couple of other kind of um, we do a school garden program where we actually fund school gardens in about 30 schools around Ireland and um, we have a community classroom program which is about connecting community gardens with schools to kind of bring them together to support each other in growing um, so it's a hugely important part of our work and all, all, of, all of the details and, and registration for that would be on our website. I'm going to kind of check that out for my kids to schools to make yeah. sure they're, they're involved. Um, so recently you produced the Know It All Almanac and I, I don't know if you've seen it but I did a little video review on it. I uh, bought it for my kids and decided that it was so great I'd do a bit of a review. Uh, but do you want to tell me a little bit about the books you have here? Yeah, like so I guess a huge part, like we're, we're a social enterprise um, which effectively means that we, we, we generate our own income to fund our work so we're not, we don't, we don't get government funding, we don't get donations from the public as such. We're not a charity, but we we are not for profit. So we basically use products uh, like the books and our TV series and, and products like Growbox to they're kind of they have a they have a double bottom line for us. They're about helping people to grow food and, and do it more successfully. And they also generate income for us. And the books are a huge part of that. Grow Coquiche has been out for about you know the second edition of that came out last year. Um, for, for adults and then um, we, we always wanted to do a kids book and I, I'm, um, uh, I've got two, two young kids myself so I suppose I wanted to write a book that they'd be able to read as well you know and I got together with uh, a wonderful uh, broadcaster and writer Mernie Kivon who had a TV series about growing and cooking on, on RT called Digging Diner so we wrote the book together and then and we got an amazing illustrator called Fatty Burke, who I'm sure some of your, your viewers would know from art she did art in the media and, and history of media. Um, and so we put it all together and the idea was to kind of the idea of an almanac which is a very kind of horticultural kind of thing where it's like a book that has all the information you need and um, you know the moon times and all sorts of mad information all crammed into a book. And uh, so it was kind of riffing off that but um, called it a know it almanac instead of a, an almanac and um, like there's just a load of information that follows the follows the months and the seasons so it will tell you each month what to, what to do it's kind of half growing and half cooking and loads of um, craft stuff in it as loads well of craft, yeah. Like it's like that, yeah. and then loads of just really funny gags and we wanted it to work for kind of you know the parents reading it for their kids or with their kids would also get a good giggle out of it well, lots yep. of farmer and your jokes. Well, the first thing my 13 year old picked out was on the back Russell Sprout's uh, mm -hmm. comment saying that he learned absolutely nothing at all. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a bit of fun. Yeah, we had good fun with Russell because, you know, Russell Sprouts are either the low, mm -hmm. kind of love it or love them um, veg, so he's um, kind of trying to get into the book all, all the way through it and uh, gets his moment in the sun at the end. I won't, I won't spoil that, yeah. but uh, yeah, he's a good crack. Great, so Michael, in my interviews, I'm always asking for three tips from your experience that uh, can help improve the health of the nation. What three tips would you give? Well, it's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think the first thing, I, I, I worry that our, our, our discussions around food have got incredibly narrow and, and lack nuance. So we're very much kind of focused on everything you read and hear about and, and discuss about food it's very much like this diet's good that diet's bad and you know if you take out carbs or dairy or meat or you know add protein or whatever you're going to be healthy and I, I think that's just um, nonsense <laughs> um, and I think anything you eat can be either healthy or not healthy it can be either sustainable or not sustainable even the same two things do you know what I mean yeah. so 
So the first thing I think is, is to think about seasonality in particular and the impact that eating seasonally has on your health. So I, I would always give the example of, of, um, of sweet corn where when I grew up myself, my, my mother used to say that you should run from the vegetable patch into the kitchen to get it into, into a pot of water because as soon as you pick it off the plant, it's deteriorating from a taste perspective and from a nutrition perspective. So in the context of that, think about the, the two sweet corn you see in, in a vacuum pack in a supermarket that's been imported from Kenya or, you know, and, and, and sitting in, in suspended in plastic for, for whatever, six months, you know. So anyway, fo like following the seasons and eating in season means, um, particularly when you combine it with local, means you're eating food that's at its most nutritious and its most delicious. And we, okay. you know, if you follow the seasons in terms of what nature thinks that we need at different times of the year for our bodies, then you're plugging back into a real wisdom in, in terms of eating that we've completely lost. So, you know, the hydrating veg like tomatoes and cucumbers in the summer, you know, the, the earthy root crops at this time of the year, the, the spring greens in the spring to revitalize your system and so on. You know, that, that's a type of eating we've almost completely forgot about. So I think plug back into what's in season in your locality at any given time and you can't go too far off. So that'll be the first thing. I think the second thing then is, and again, it's never discussed, but we need to start thinking about how healthy was the soil that your food was growing. You know, again, we just tend to think about I'm eating a carrot, it must be good for me. But th there can be a huge difference between carrot A grown in healthy living soil and carrot B grown in, you know, unhealthy, monocropped, you know, uh, industrial produced. Often even organically, you know, and that, that is controversial enough, but organic food doesn't necessarily mean healthy food all the time. It can so how can would be. we how would we find out about how do we know about well, it's tricky. It's really tricky, um, and and it's, it's very very difficult to actually find out. I think technology will help in the years ahead because there's there's devices coming um, that will help you to compare to, to actually measure the nutrient density in food. But for now, it's really about trying to buy from producers and farmers who who care about the quality of the soil that they're growing in, and the same applies to the meat that are. That you know, the soil that our meat is rare on. Yeah. So it's like it's really, really tricky. Um, but I think again, that's why growing your own food, when you're, when you're so focused on the nutrition in your soil and putting compost on the soil in the winter and so on, and having soil that's bursting with life, that's why GIYers always say to us, Jesus, I grew this food myself and it tastes completely different to anything I've ever tasted before. You know, like a proper carroty carrot. Yeah. Because it's and the reason it tastes like a carroty carrot is because of the soil that's grown. That's the second one. And it's look, I, I, I get it's not as simple, it's not as simple as like take carbs out of your diet and you'll be healthy. It's 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 all about the wants. Um, and then the third thing, and it's the most it's been our it's been our sort of leading insight and um, that's that's sort of driven everything we do in GIY is is to grow some of your own food and, and it's not doesn't have to be 100% of your own food, even if it's only 1%, it, it makes you a more knowledgeable, more, um, as we call it, food food empathy, so food empathetic consumer, because you, you know more about your food because you've grown some of it yourself. Um, and it changes the other 99% of the food that you buy as a result. So growing your own food is one of the most powerful ways of really getting knowledge, and knowledge is king when it comes to food choices we make. Great tips, I know I certainly have to work on the third one. Yeah. I grow, um, I'm not great in the garden, I do uh, rosemary, bay leaf, uh, thyme and mint, I'll, I'll have those. That's great. But that's it. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like, again, the, the, the horticultural yeah. world, which I suppose I'm part of, like, has done a very bad job, actually, of convincing people, and it's a very snooty Latin name, it's, you have to grow everything yourself, otherwise you're useless, you don't, you know, if you can't grow anything, you don't have green fingers and all this, and all of that is, is complete nonsense. You just need to give it a try, keep, you know, don't worry if things don't work off and they don't. And, and like, we're an example of that. We've, we've had a terrible year with salads. Like, it happens from year to year. Uh, but as long as you just keep, keep producing as much as you can, 
any little shift you can make towards a bit of a bit more self-sufficiency is an amazing thing for your health and, and for your sustainability and and your happiness as well. I think. Correct. Well, I definitely do. Going back to number one, I do the season, and I actually have a video for each month of the year what's in season in Ireland and links to some recipes. So I definitely do. Right. Number one. Yeah. So what's next for GIY? Um, so I mean, we're we're busy at the moment through uh, recording. Uh, the third series of our TV series called Cook Eat, which will be out in, in March of next year. Okay. Um, and we're, hope, we're hoping obviously to start filming series four next year as well. So we'll, we'll keep doing that. We've really exciting programs that we're starting to roll out for, uh, for chefs, a program called Chef's Manifesto, okay. which is trying to get chefs to bring more sustainability into their kitchens. Um, and, and ultimately we just feel we need to do everything we do, but on a much, much bigger scale. Because the you know, without getting too downbeat about it, like the the planet is in serious, serious trouble, and we've got to completely remake how we how we eat and feed ourselves um, as part of an overall complete shift in our lives. I think in the next three to five years, in particular, and and we feel we've we've a formula we know works at scale and we just need to reach more and more people. So we, we've signed, um, we've set a commitment for ourselves as an organization as part of the UN's decade of change to try and reach 100 million people over the next 10 years with our programs, which you know we've, we've no idea how we're gonna do it currently, but it's, it's, it's great to have a really ambitious goal. Um, and you know, I think, I think we need more and more people to sort of, to be thinking that way about, about um, Sustainability and climate emergency and really get stuck in and scale. It. So that's that's. Because you're thinking. already working outside of Ireland, isn't that right, sure? Yeah, we like this year about about in 2019 about 600,000 people will take part in one of our programs in Ireland, the UK, and North America. Um, so, but like we're going to have to scale that up by by 10 or 20 times to kind of hit that that 100 million yeah. number, but. We'll have a lot of fun trying and, and um, we're very proud of all the work we do and, and a very small, very hard working team. Okay. So Michael, it's your last meal. What would you choose? That's a great question. Um, it's probably not what you think actually, but okay. I tell you, um, I'm a huge, probably my, my favourite food stuff in the world is sausages, which are like <laughs> possibly funny. not what you'd expect. <laughs> But I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of um, Jane Russell, who um, produces an amazing, like to me a sausage can either be a really unhealthy, awful thing, or it can be, uh, when it's done really well, it's pork, you know, like it's pork meat with very little additives and, and nothing added to it, and can be very health, healthful, I think. Um, and Jane Russell, we serve our sausages in the cafe here every, uh, every morning. Um, so Jane Russell sausages will be on the list. Okay. Um, I'm a huge fan of sauerkraut and kimchi and all yeah. that kind of thing. Again, coming back to the fermentation and preservation of food. Um, I grow a lot of my own cabbage and so I make my own sauerkraut which goes really well with sausages. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have some sauerkraut on that and then... Would you do plain or do you season it up? Do you put spices and things into it or um, veg in or do you like just a plain? I, I do too, cabbage? like I do. I, I love it just a regular Fairly, fairly plain sauerkraut and then a couple of different types of kimchi but I think for my last meal I go back to the sauerkraut okay. probably the plain one um, and then the bread it's served on is absolutely critical so I would have said a water for the blah a couple of years ago but I've become a bit which are still an amazing an amazing product but a um, big fan of, of um, we have an amazing local baker here called Seagull Bakery out in Tremor okay. again we serve we serve our sourdough bread uh, here in the cafe, and I think I'd have it on. So the sausages and the sauerkraut on yeah. a slice of toast sour and toast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that'd be it. I mean, it's not a very exciting meal as last meal's go. No, but look, it's it's, like, I find it really interesting in all of these interviews uh, getting different people's yeah. last meals. Would you have anything to drink with that? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I normally with that kind of a meal, I'd have a nice cup of tea, but that's not very exciting. No, but that's, for my, you can my, if it's my last meal, it's probably going to be uh, probably like a glass of red wine. I think it's not going to be very, not going to go very well with circuit though. That's a maybe maybe a good craft beer. I haven't thought of it that. Okay. 
Okay. So either um, again a local brew, maybe a Metalan or a Dungarvan or Pele, or could go as far as Kinsale, Blacks of Kinsale maybe. Um, so a nice, a nice lager would probably go better with the sour bread than, the, than a red wine. Yeah, I think yeah. so. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. And if my audience want to get in touch with you, what's, what's the best way? Um, so our website is giy.ie, so everything you need to know is on that. And even, even the, the, you'll find links there to the TV show, which is still up on the, the RT player. It's now on Amazon Prime as well, worldwide, which we're very pleased about. So Fantastic. you can still catch up on all the former episodes of that and all the information about our programs and our shop to buy the book and all that on giy.ie. Okay, fantastic. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Michael Kelly from Grow It Yourself and you're inspired now to try and grow some things in the garden. Please like and comment below and don't forget to subscribe so you get to see some of my videos as soon as they're released. Why not check out some of my other videos like how to make sauerkraut or other interviews like with Siobhan D on reversing type 2 diabetes and resilience for type 2 diabetes. Thanks for watching. See you soon.